Sir, we are good to start. Hi, this is Dr. Azim, uh, emergency physician, Yeshoda Hospital, Malakpet. And uh, welcome to our Friday webinars as, as conducted by Yeshoda Hospital, uh, Semi and Anbai. Uh, today, our topic of uh, topic is uh, approach to topical infections in ED as presented by our uh, Dr. Mohan Kumar, uh, Faculty Division of Acute Care and Emergency Medicine, Department of And uh, as it as presented by today, our speaker, Dr. Mohan sir. Mohan sir, over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll just share my screen and start with the presentation. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm audible, sir, now? Yes. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, before we start today's topic, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Srinath, sir, for giving me this opportunity to talk to all of you. And I would like also to thank uh, the Asia Group of Hospitals and uh, Semi Group. Without um, delay, much delaying uh, with this, we will start with the topic. Uh, with approach to the tropical infections in the ED. So, today we would be discussing on what is a tropical infection and how frequently do we see that in the emergency department, uh, them in the emergency department, and how do we approach them on a syndromic approach. And then we will talk about some common tropical infections in brief. So my presentation would go for another next 25 to 30 minutes. So I would uh, ask everyone if someone else, some of the attendees can also switch on your cameras. It would be helpful for me rather than looking at the blank screen and talking to you all. <laughs> if uh, I request that some of the students can switch on your camera. If not, it's OK. Let's continue. So before we go, what is a tropical infection? Why is it called a tropical infection? What is it tropical about? Where does this tropical region come from? Basically, as you see in the monitor, uh, as you see in the screen, around the equator, uh, there is Tropic of Cancer on the Northern Hemisphere and Tropic of Capricorn in the Southern Hemisphere. The area in between these two tropics is called as the tropical area. So why are we discussing specifically about this tropical area? Because around 30, 39 to 40% of the entire land mass, entire land mass of the world resides, comes within the tropical area. And around 40 to 45% of the population of the entire world are in this the tropical area. And uh, this figure, as it goes now, as India is increasing with the population, around 50% of the total world's population would be in this tropical area. So it would be good for us to discuss uh, about the tropical region. And so why tropical diseases? Because there is something different from the tropical climate, which is uh, which differs uh, compared to the rest of the world. So these are the two images which I have taken. One is from the uh, Western Ghats, and the other is from the hills of the Meghalayas. So the tropical areas receive the direct sunlight and they receive the maximum duration of the sunlight. So they have the intense solar radiation and these areas have this uh, dense rainforest and which gives a humid environment. So which can uh, be a habitat for the sticks, mites and mosquitoes. 
so this uh, climate and the region makes it unique so because of this uh, uh, vectors which are present in this area and in this climate this makes these diseases to be more common among this so what are the tropical diseases which we would be discussing today there is one more uh, one more confusion always between what is a tropical disease and what is tropical medicine what is tropical infectious disease so today we would be more uh, talking only on the tropical infectious diseases so this is the father of tropical medicine he is uh, patrick manson and uh, he has the text uh, he start he was the british physician who was working in taiwan and hong kong and he worked in this area for around 30 years and he started picking up the diseases which were more common in this area and then he uh, described that there were some microbes which were causing this disease that is not with the environment but still the experts limited themselves to coin the term with as tropical disease or the disease which is uh, more common among the human race so coming to the common tropical infectious diseases in this region uh dengue malaria leptospirosis kala azar rickettsial diseases and enteric fevers are more common in this area there is a huge uh, why how frequently do we see them in this so this is the another world map which i have taken from the manson's tropical textbook which shows that the annual infection rate of dengue is more common in the southeast asia region where india then this is indonesia malaysia bangladesh pakistan this all areas has the huge uh, burden of the dengue apart from that when it comes to the uh, india our country this is the map which i have recently taken from the national vector disease control program this shows that our states like rajasthan gujarat maharashtra telangana karnataka kerala and tamil nadu have pockets of dengue till date so whereas for the scrub typhus we have a suchugamoshi triangle which is described uh, as three different parts one part is in the uh, three different points of the triangle one point is in the area between uh, japan and north korea and other in the middle east and the third one near the uh, asia pacific uh, islands so this scrub typhus is more common in this area but now reports are there from the chile area south america as well and some from the middle east area as well which is out of this triangle the scrub has also been described so this was one of the latest systematic review which they did for the tropical infection acute undifferentiated febrile illness where the tropical diseases also come among them and this also they included around 43 studies out of which uh 80500 cases were included among them dengue was the most common infection and followed by lepto typhoid scrub and influenza viral illnesses these all were more seen and according even in this study around 45 to 50% were of unknown diagnosis so most common we have viral followed by bacterial then malaria so what is why are we discussing or why do we choose the tropical diseases for this why it is so it is a internal topic for a tropical medicine physician topic why are we discussing for the emergency department ed physicians because whenever this patient comes to our ed they have a common symptom profile and their signs are non specific all the common infections which i have talked till now all would present with the non specific fever myalgia headache some have shortness of breath some have altered sensorium so either of the any of these symptoms doesn't have any specific localizing value so and whenever these patients come you cannot investigate for all the tropical infections you need to narrow down your infections you cannot have the entire battery of investigations to go ahead for them so in such cases how do we approach them by by taking a comprehensive history having our examination focused examination to look for uh, the eska rashes purpura any bleeding manifestations apart from that we need to look for the season these tropical diseases have a seasonal variation so whenever uh, it's around the monsoon usually because they need a humid climate 
so whether it is in the northern part of the country or the southern part of the country the there is a humid climate around the monsoon so we have a peak spike in the cases we have a spike in the cases around uh, july june july august september which as progresses till the month of november so apart from that you need to know the local epidemiology so malaria you cannot see it in the hilly areas as they have cold climate and the mosquitoes does not breed there and one someone who is working in an occupation who is among the scrubs or in the jungle they would be more dealt with the scrub typhus so you need to look for any evidence of other localizing uh, local infections which may be causing similar symptoms so you need to think about them as well so when you have these huge uh, uh, symptom profile so what did the experts do so let us see they made the guidelines uh, people from uh, different institutes sat down and they thought that we will make a guideline to approach for the tropical fever they thought rather than going for an individual disease we will go with the syndromic approach so which can guide the uh, physicians to choose which back which investigation to go ahead or to choose which type of empirical therapy to be started early so they made into five major syndromes the first one is the undifferentiated fever so we would be discussing the each of these in detail undifferentiated fever fever with arthralgia and thrombocytopenia fever with ards fever with cns involvement and fever with multi organ dysfunction syndrome so there is another group which is from uh, aims rishikesh and jipmer what they thought as instead of having a syndromic approach this was published in the year 2020 they thought that whenever the patient comes with fever look for the evidence of sepsis if there is sepsis follow the survival sepsis guidelines if there is evidence of any clinical localization such as a limb infection or a chest infection investigate for a country if there is any no localization and no sepsis then you can they divide it on depending on the duration of fever if the fever is just for one to two days you just need to, need not do anything no investigations and no medications just if she has a fever treat for the fever and if uh, you treat them symptomatically if the fever if the patient comes someone on the day 3 or day 4 then you look for the uh, investigations routine investigations which you do in the ed apart from that you do the rapid kit for the malaria dengue and scrub now when a patient comes after day 4 so you will do the same investigations apart from that you will send the cultures as well so in the today we will discuss about the syndromic approach of each of this i'll just have two two slides regarding this we will go so whenever a patient comes with undifferentiated fever as we saw the more frequency the systematic these are the five things which i picked up from there malaria scrub lepto entering dengue and viral illness so how do we differentiate when they present to our ed malaria typically have the history of paroxysms of fever where they have a hot uh, stage and a cold stage they have chills and rigors and uh, scrub typhus also have presents with non specific manifestations they have headache myalgia and they can have painless scar when you look for detail around 30 to 40% of the patients does have a scar so when it comes to lepto they will have abdominal pain and congenital suffusion enteric patients have uh, relative bradycardia and some hepatosplenomegaly until and unless they land in a hlh or in a macrocyte activating syndrome where they have large size hepato liver large kidney large uh, spleen dengue patients present with retro orbital pain and they can have bleeding manifestations so the other common viral infections such as h1n1 covid all can present with undifferentiated fever but they do have a history of urt pariza cough would be there so for the next syndromic diagnosis whenever the patient comes with fever with rash and thrombocytopenia again you have the same differentials whether dengue scrub meningococcal infections enteric fever and hsv or chikungunya here also they have the same profile the dengue patients have the maculopapular rash the scrub do have the painless scar 
these scars are usually present in the groin area to the axillary area we need to look for them until you look for them it's difficult to find an scar meningococcal infections you will have meningococcemia typical rashes i will show you the images of the rashes apart from that enteric fever 30 to 40% of the patients uh, with enteric fever do present with the rose spots which is uh, uh, less difficult to pick up and they usually you can pick it up when they have a fair skin a uh, people otherwise it's difficult to pick up zoster has the typical vesicular rashes and chikungunya would present with a uh, rash which is similar to dengue uh, now i would like to ask the students can you identify the rashes and just write down if you are active so do i know that i am not putting you on sleep can you reply on the chat box what is one the first rash the second rash the third rash uh does everyone have the writing uh, chat chatting option sir or is it closed sir it's open sir yeah uh, i open. would request that the students can write down well, what is in the chat box what is one what is two what is three if you can identify them the first crash was in the which was taken in our emergency which is a typical maculopapular rash uh, as i have no replace till now so i'll go ahead with the, the uh, description of these rashes the first one is which was uh, captured uh, this is not this is the maculopapular rash of the typical of dengue this is the second one is the scar with the halo around it this we have published in the id cases this i have taken from there the third one is the image of the rose spots which is among the which was taken from a salmonella positive culture patient and this image i have taken from up to date this is of the meningococcemia these rashes look like this purpuric rashes but they are palpable this is the fifth one is another one which we have taken from a communicable disease ward this is of the vesicular papular rashes so whenever patient come with this the first is dengue or chikungunya can also have second is crab typhus third is enteric fourth is meningococcemia and fifth is hsv so this is how you need to look for specifically for the fever with rashes the rash can guide you towards the therapy so the coming to the third syndrome fever with encephalopathy so whenever the patients have altered sensorium and present to the ed think of these cerebral malaria although the incidence is coming down now i will show you the i have we would discuss in detail about malaria cerebral malaria meningitis then encephalitis and many non infectious diseases for the cerebral malaria usually you can do the smear if the smear is not readily available you can do the rapid diagnostic kit based on hrp antigen or pndl and then or for the meningitis you can look for the local signs if they have neck rigidity and you can uh, there are uh, japic such as uh, uh, certain diseases are can present as an epidemic so you should know about the local history, epidemic history the csf can show cells and whenever you have uh, put it on a gram stain they can show a coccoe gram post coccoe or coccoe bacilli will be visible Uh, whenever there is a cortex involvement, then you call it as a meningoencephalitis. These patients can present with seizures. So either HSV or Japanese encephalitis do present with fever with encephalopathy. Other less common causes: dengue. Now CNS manifestations among dengue, scrub typhus, brucella has been picking up. That may be a tertiary care center bias as well. But we do see cases of CNS involvement of dengue than scrub typhus. then apart from that there may be other non uh, infectious causes which can present with fever or altered sensorium such as a neuroleptic malignant syndrome someone an antipsychotic drugs comes with it fever or altered sensorium then you can think of nms someone has can present with cvt someone who has a history of uh, dehydration history of travel to a high altitude then think about cvt then the outside temperature is high you can think of heat stroke this was one of the study uh, done from our center uh, which was uh, done a decade ago which also showed that fever with, with 
the encephalopathy benigno encephalitis was the most common cause apart from that the next was more common was myogenic meningitis tubercular meningitis then cvt and the list goes on according to the uh, how common it is so this is the flow chart described by the again by the tropical uh, uh, fever management guideline where they tell that whenever a patient come with seizures give with anti epileptics and if you have a localizing sign or if you have raised icp then go with uh, the measures to decrease the icp and control the fever and go ahead with imaging if there are no localizing signs go ahead with csf analysis if csf is suggestive of something treat specific with specific treatment if it does not then you can go with the empirical therapy with ceftriaxone and acyclovir which would cover majority of your tropical infections apart from that you can test for dengue malaria and scrub with the rdt attack emergencies and guide the therapy accordingly so whenever a patient comes with fever and drds again we have a similar list with scrub malaria scrub you have a scar malaria you have chills and rises h1n1 or covid you all have the coryza history then for a community community acquired pneumonia you would have other localizing symptoms uh, localizing to respiratory tract as for there would be leukocytosis the chest x ray would show the lobe of consolidation or if the patient stays for a longer duration you have a et aspirate or you have a sputum which shows a culture positive apart from that some connective tissue diseases can also present with fever and drds so these connective tissue diseases can present with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage we do see patients with lupus vasculitis apla they can present with fever and drds other causes for fever with multi organ dysfunction would be bacterial sepsis in such patients you need to look for the local sources so the most common would be the respiratory or the uti or the catheter associated skin and soft tissue then other all infections we have discussed if it is hepatic illness they can also go ahead lead to embodies in such patients you would have a prodrome for the hepatic illness and if you have a patient if you are suspecting of a hlh either primary or a secondary to a dengue scrub or malaria they can present with pancytopenia and organometallic as well now let us discuss about some common diseases some common diseases after we have seen the approach how we will go to undifferentiated fever how we will go to fever with the rds fever with encephalopathy fever with rash now we'll see how these common diseases which we are uh, which is dengue viral more common followed by the capsule followed by protozoa so first let's see with the dengue so dengue presents with uh, three phases of illness a uh, febrile phase where they can have the non specific symptoms of fatigue malaise retroorbital pain then vomiting followed by rash and flushing then for around 4 to 5 days after that is the critical phase where the patient has the vascular leak syndrome or they can have all this bleeding manifestations or they can complicate to organ involvement such as dengue myocarditis cns involvement of the dengue then it can involve the kidney as well following after around 10 days the dengue would be improving and it can go to the recovery phase so dengue you can diagnose either with a detection of the viral components in the serum or by pcr or indirectly by serological methods or now you have the rapid diagnostic kits which can give you both ns1 antigen igm and igg as well so with this you can detect uh, dengue in the emergency department the serological diagnosis has a limiting factor where so if the patient has been recently uh, infected with dengue or if he has been vaccinated against dengue or any other virus so they can have a false positive so it would be better to go for rt pc or ns1 antigen based so this is how if it is the patient comes to you within the first four days is either rt pc or ns1 is positive and as the time progresses the virus the viremia disappears so rt pc can become negative as early as day 6 day 7 and you go ahead with 
NS1 and IgM till the end of the first week. As of now, there are no effective viral treatment. Treatment remains supportive for dengue. As they give a paracetamol, do a CBC, look for the bleeding manifestations, monitor the vitals, check the hematocrit regularly. So whenever required, if they are not improving, then take allow them oral fluids as a, more as possible. If the hematocrit has increased more than 20%, then you can start with the crystalloids. If the patient does not respond to this, then you can go ahead, then you can uh, treat as a severe dengue shock syndrome. Initially, you can replace with crystalloids. If not improving, then you can add colloids. Coming to the second infection, Scruptitis, you all know that it is caused by the bacteria Orientia Shushugomoshi. It was found, it has been described uh, way back around uh, in the first century as well with different, different names, but it came to the highlight when during the Second World War. As many of the US forces who were in Vietnam ended up with fever of unknown origin, then it was they started investigating for scrub types. The scrub can vary from right from mild illness to a fatal disease. They can present with high grade fever, headache. They can have multiple system involvement. The initial four to five days, they have a mild illness, but the disease severity can progress after the end of one week. And by two weeks, they can end with CNS, respiratory, or cardiac, or end up with pneumonia. Around uh, 30 to 40 percent of the patients with scrub do have a maculopapular rash similar to dengue. But we do miss it's not so generalized as we see in dengue, but uh, it's usually on the trunk restricted to trunk area. SCAR is present. SCAR, you usually need to look them. You need to look for in the groin area, in the axillary area. So you know, we do what we do is in the emergency department when I go for the round site, tell them to look to have isolated areas, strip them, look for the SCARs. And we have done studies from where the SCAR biopsy PCR has also shown scrub typhus uh, positive. And around 30 to 40 percent of the patients do present with lymphadenopathy. There are various tests which do which we do for scrub typhus. Currently, RDT is available readily across everyone. Uh, readily available RDT tests are enough. But the guidelines still tells that to have. Wheel felix. The limitation factor of the wheel felix is that it uh, has a poor sensitivity. Apart from that, you need to repeat the test so you can have a retrospective diagnosis. RDT is better. PCR problem is it's not available at every area. So uh, whenever PCR is available, PCR is the standard. The treatment for scrub would be either with doxycycline or azithromycin. So whenever there is a CNS involvement or the disease severity, you can add rifampicin as well. We did a study uh, which was published uh, in the last year in New England Journal of Medicine. We compared in the scrub, severe scrub typhus patients, intravenous doxycycline versus intravenous azithromycin or combination of azithromycin plus doxycycline. In this study, we showed that we had a composite outcome of day 28 fever defervescence, day 28 mortality and other complications. The combination therapy of doxycycline plus azithromycin in severe patients had a better outcome compared to doxycycline alone or azithromycin alone. Coming to malaria, this would be the last one which we would be discussing. As I have already told, they would be presenting with paroxysms with alternating with uh, febrile period and non-febrile period. And uh, usually they uh, improve by themselves at all. How severe the disease would be it depends on the host status. How his immunity is there? Does he have any underlying immunosuppressed conditions such as diabetes? Or is he on any chemotherapy? Or is he uh, <coughs> uncontrolled sugars? Or does he have uh, any underlying malignancy? And such, when there is an impaired immune system of the horse, in such patients, malaria would be most severe. So now, 
uh, the number of cases of malaria has decreased. This is the latest which was available on the NBDCP, uh, which I took out uh, today afternoon. The number of cases compared to the last two decades has come down where it was around 15 lakh cases in 2000. It has come down to 10 lakh cases in 2011. And 2022, the number of cases, of total number of cases is around less than 2 lakhs. And the mortality, which is in the red line, even the mortality which were in the thousands has come down to less than 100 in the last five years. So malaria, because of this, the, the, we see less malaria in the ED. As we all have been studying about malaria right from the microbiology time, I will not go into much into the thick smear or thin smear. We have the RDTs readily available at the ED. So whenever we have an RDT, uh, we go ahead, we do the test. If it is positive for Vivax, treat with chloroquine and present. Whenever it is positive for falciparum, you have artemisin combination therapy. So if the patient, if at all, he does not respond, or if he gets a complication, then you can use artemether uh, combination therapy where you can use we name with either of the artisanate or artimeter or artimeter. So this is the first uh, 48 hours you give the IV medicines. Then you can discharge them based on the patient's improvement. So to conclude, what we follow the mnemonic is for the tropical infections whenever the patients come is LEMDES, L-E-M-D-S, Lepto, Enteric, Malaria, Dengue and Scrub. So whenever the patient comes in the typical season, monsoon season or post-monsoon season, we do prescribe it tell, send lambdas, check for lambdas. And the tropical, whenever the patient, such patients come, you could not localize. You can go ahead with empirical therapy. They are cost-effective. You do save lives. Septraxone covers for lepto, enteric. And for malaria, doxycycline does cover for it. For the scrub, doxycycline covers. For dengue, anyhow, you don't have a specific treatment. When you have a doubt of a tropical fever, either of lambdas, which are the common diseases which we see in the entire country, start them empirically on septraxone or doxycycline. As early as possible, you start them, the patients would improve. They are cost benefit. There are multiple health economic studies as well which show that this is more cost uh, effective therapy. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Yes, sir. And as we as as we see in the ED, uh, most of the our students are complaints of comes up with the symptoms overlap. And uh, this important to do a, a comprehensive uh, comprehensive history taking focal examination, and we and we spoke uh, you spoke about local epidemiology and syndromic approach. Uh, definitely, this would help uh, to uh, diagnose these tropical infections very easily. Uh, thanks a lot for your enlightenment. Yes, sir. Anything else? Any sir? questions? Have... Yes. Sir. If there are any questions, uh, you can uh, just uh, type the questions. Sir, I think there are no questions. Yeah, okay. no questions, sir. And I would like to thank uh, our organizing chairperson, Dr. Srina, sir, our organizing secretary, uh, Dr. Kiran, sir, uh, Dr. Vinit, sir, and organizing team, Dr. Raghu, and uh, Raghu, sir, and uh, Dr. Saujanya, madam. Uh, thank you, Mohan, sir. Thank you for uh, your wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for providing the opportunity, sir.